Hello everyone, this is Mr. Schultz and this is AP Biology video 1.4. This video is going to cover proteins, which is Biology in Focus section 3.5. So, a couple of things about proteins. Number one, proteins are essential for all cells. They make up about 50% of the dry mass of cells. So if we took a cell and we dried it out, we got rid of all the liquid in it, and we measured the mass of all the stuff that's left over, about half of it would actually be protein. So most of the cell is made of protein, which is really interesting because we talk about like phospholipids and carbohydrates and things like that, but proteins are the big deal. And so um, a quick word, a vocab word, is a catalyst, is a chemical that speeds up reactions. In terms of proteins, we call these proteins enzymes. And enzymes are really important because they help control, they speed up and keep uh, chemical reactions going inside of our cells. And so enzymes are really important. In fact, we're going to have a whole lab on it later in the year. Proteins in and of themselves are really unique. Each type of protein has its own 3D shape. And that 3D shape helps determine its structure and its function. And so if it doesn't have the right shape, its function doesn't work correctly. And so now we have proteins that don't do things that they're supposed to. And we end up with either different traits or diseases that can cause major issues. An example would be like sickle cell anemia is one little letter change in uh, the DNA sequence causes one amino acid to change, which causes the whole structure of the protein to change within the blood cell. And I have a nice little table here of like, how much, what percent of the total weight and dry weight each thing is. Only 3% of E. coli's weight is DNA and 1% in our cells, whereas proteins is like 60% in our cells, 50 to 55 in E. coli. Um, so this is pretty important. And I have two little um, protein structures here. And so these are, are approximate or like model proteins. And so hemoglobin, which carries oxygen within our blood, um, and collagen, which is a structural protein within our cells. Now, proteins have nine different functions. Um, and so I'm going to go through each one a little bit. There's enzymatic uh, proteins, which are um, going to be what we use for controlling chemical reactions. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about those later in the year. There will be a whole video on like enzymes and metabolism in cells. There are defensive proteins. Proteins that um, help protect the body. So antibodies are an example of a protein that helps protect the body. Um, they help fight infections. Storage proteins are proteins that, that actually store things. So like um, milk is an example of a storage protein. It stores um, proteins, amino acids for infants to use to make proteins themselves, as well as some energy. Transport proteins that carry things to and from cells um, they allow things into and out of the cells. Maybe they're used for holding oxygen within blood cells. Hormonal proteins are um, hormones like insulin is made from protein or helps made from proteins, um, which are used for carbohydrate metabolism. Receptor proteins, they receive um, signals. They're like our nerve cells, but also other cells have receptor proteins as well. There are contractile proteins, which help with movement of both the cells themselves as well as tissues and other things. So our, our muscle cells are made of a whole bunch of contractile proteins that allow us to actually move. Um, it's how my jaw is moving as I make this video right now. And then finally, there are toxin proteins. Some uh, organisms make toxins that make them poisonous or um, maybe help with making venom, which would make you venomous. So snakes are venomous. Um, eating bad bacteria can be toxic. Um, so just be aware of that. Poisons are things you ingest. Toxins are, or venoms are things that get put into you, um, usually against your will. Now, in terms of proteins, proteins are made up of monomers. And these monomers are called amino acids. And all amino acids have a similar structure. They have an amine group, which is this NH2 group. They have two carbons. Um, and this is a carboxyl group at the end. And what's going to happen is this carboxyl group and this amine group are going to make a water through dehydration synthesis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, especially when we start talking about um, transcription and translation, which is how the body makes proteins. And then there's always what's called an R group. The R group um, determines what kind of amino acid you have, and it also helps determine the structure of the protein. So different R groups react differently with each other, and they create the 3D structure. The polymers of proteins are called pep polypeptides. 
a protein doesn't actually um, doesn't form until the polypeptide has been modified and folded. So we have these long chains of amino acids. They're called polypeptides. But until they've been folded properly, they're not really a protein yet. They can't do the functions that the protein has. And so sometimes they fold on their own. And then other times we have enzymes that help fold certain proteins as well because some proteins actually are multiple parts and they're going to need some help. Proteins require a 3D structure, a very specific 3D structure, to function correctly. And if that 3D structure is incorrect in certain places, it can actually affect the function of the protein. And this is really important because this is where we see like genetic defects and things like that. Sickle cell anemia is an example where we have one little change in a protein that changes the whole shape. And it changes the function of it as well. Um, so here are the amino acids, and there's this really nice amino acid chart, and I'll probably print one off for class as well. Um, the amino acids are organic molecules with both an amino group and a carboxyl group. So here's the amino group, here's the carboxyl group. It might not be a bad idea just to draw it out so you have an idea of, oh yeah, this is what an amino acid looks like. You don't have to know all of them, by the way. You don't need to know all of these structures. That would be crazy for AP Biology. Um, even in an organic chemistry or a biochem class, you're not going to be expected to memorize all 20 amino acids um, because it's just something that, that you don't need to know. You can look it up. Um, R groups determine the chemical properties of the amino acids. The R groups are also called side chains, so be aware of that. That's a term you might hear. Hey, the side chain of the, the protein or the amino acid. And cells use 20 kinds of amino acids to make up proteins. You don't need to memorize them, okay? You don't need to know what the R groups look like. But you do need to know that um, we only have 20 that we use. There are essential amino acids, which we only get from our diets. And I believe that's going to be on a later slide. Also, if you want to, see Biology and Focus. Um, I believe it's page 23 of our textbook. And that's going to be the amino acids and their charts. And each one's got different R groups, which can affect them. So... Um, polypeptide bonds are covalent bonds formed between the carboxyl group of one amino acid and the amine group of another amino acid. And the polypeptides can vary in length from a few, th uh, from a few like a couple dozen, to thousands of amino acids depending on the protein. If the protein is really large, it's going to need lots of amino acids. And the R groups, they ultimately are going to control the structure of the protein. Another important thing you might want to write down in your notes is pause the video and draw this reaction. This is a polypeptide formation um, between amino acids. And what you're going to notice is the carboxyl group here is going to give up an OH and the amine group is going to give up a hydrogen to make water. So we call this a dehydration synthesis. We're pulling a water out of it. And what happens is we end up forming this nice little single bond between the carboxyl group and the amine group and now we have two amino acids put together and a water molecule. So this is something that requires energy and it's done by our ribosomes. And we're going to get into that much more in detail later in the year. But understand that polypeptides are chains of amino acids. Protein structure and function. Just because you have a polypeptide does not mean that you're going to have a protein in and of itself. Proteins generally do fold on their own, but they will need help from time to time, especially if it's a much bigger and complex protein. And we have enzymes for that, which, guess what, are proteins. So most proteins fall under two categories. They're either globular, in terms of they're like a spherical shape, or they're fibrous, they're long, thin fibers. In most cases, the function of a protein depends on its ability to recognize and bind to some other molecule. Um, our antibodies specifically are looking for markers on cells that don't belong, and they're going to attach so that our immune system can attack. And endorphins, which are um, specifically, you, we have specific receptors for endorphins that help um, mitigate pain and things like that. What's interesting is um, some receptor proteins have other chemicals that bind to them better than the ones that we make ourselves. An example of that is morphine is similar to an endorphin in that it fits in the same um, protein and causes a reaction in and of itself. And we'll get to chemical, uh, the cell communication things later in the year as well. So um, fibrous proteins, they consist of long parallel polypeptide chains. Um, they're generally insoluble in water, whereas globular proteins are usually soluble. Um, the structure is usually pretty stable in a fibrous protein, where globular, globular is much more... Um, fluid. It's less stable. So just be aware of it. Um, and if you want to, you can copy some of this down. It's nice to know. Um, now, 
When we talk about proteins, there are four levels of structure. And so the first level is called primary structure. The primary structure is just the amino acid sequence. There is no um, three-dimensional shape to this yet. It's just a whole bunch of amino acids, one after another. I kind of like to think of them as like beads on a necklace um, or just laying out Lego pieces in a row. And the primary structure is going to help dictate what the um, second and tertiary structure are going to be. And so we're going to have a backbone, which is just going to be like the carbon and oxygen from the carboxyl groups and the amine groups all in a row. And then you're going to have your little R groups hanging out off of one side. And so it's these R groups that are going to actually help determine later structure. Secondary structure is basically formed by hydrogen bonds between the repeating parts of the backbone. So yeah, we have these R groups and they're going to cause some issues later. Not issues, they're going to be basically help with our structure. But it's the actual backbone that creates the secondary structure. And it's basically just hydrogen bonds forming between the backbone um, of different sides of this amino acid chain. And so it's going to be able to fold in on itself. And the side chains, they don't really affect side secondary structure at all. So you're going to end up with one of two types of secondary structure. You could have an alpha helix, which is like a spinning spiral staircase. Um, the bonds form between every fourth amino acid created, creating a spiral um, structure. And you don't need to know that it's every fourth amino acid. You just need to know that secondary structure could be one of two structures. It can be a helical structure or it could be what's called beta pleated. And the parallel strands of the polypeptide chain are gonna kind of line up next to each other. And they're gonna bond and they're gonna kind of form like a crinkly um, sheet. And so it's one or the other. And a protein can have more than one secondary structure in and of itself. So one part of it could be a sheet, a beta pleated sheet, and the other one could be an alpha helix. So don't just assume that a protein is gonna have just one kind. So tertiary structure, provides the overall shape of the protein. And this is where our R groups come into play. And it can be caused by different kinds of interactions between our R groups. And you will need to know these four types. So one is called hydrogen bonds, which we've talked about in our water video already, which is formed between um, hydrogen and oxygen or nitrogen. In this case, it's gonna mostly be ox uh, hydrogen, sorry, nitrogen. Um, from the amine groups and the hydrogens from the R groups. And sometimes it can be between R groups as well because most of this is R group related. It can also be caused by hydrophobic interactions, which are also gonna in this case be van der Waals reactions or interactions. Um, and this is just, there are hydrophobic R groups that don't like being near water. And so they'll kind of clump together similar to the way phospholipids like to clump together as well. There's another group called disulfide bonds. They're pretty important. They're a vocab word, so you see it highlighted in blue. Um, and this is just between two sulfide R groups. And they just match up with each other, and then they bond together. And it's a pretty strong bond. And then there are ionic bonds, which are between um, positive and negative R groups bonding together to create this 3D structure. What's really interesting is, um, for a long time, it was really hard to figure out what these 3D structures were. But with the advent of computers and technology, we can actually use computer programs and we put the amino acid chains in there and then we do the folding for the secondary structure and then we can start to figure out the tertiary structure by playing with the, the shape of it. And there's actually a really cool game called Fold It. And if you look it up online, you can actually help scientists figure out the structure of proteins. So scientists enter the amino acid sequence in and then you can play the game to help figure out what the 3D structure is. Um, a few years back, they used a similar program or this program to figure out a protein found in um, HIV. And so it's helping scientists to figure out where proteins are. and Maybe we can help block proteins from being made or figure out how they work and things like that, which is really interesting. Now, the last structure in a protein is called quaternary structure. And it doesn't always happen in every protein but a lot of proteins do this. It's an aggregation of polypeptide units. So it's like taking three smaller pieces and putting them together to make one big protein. And this helps with building structure and helping uh, do certain jobs. So like hemoglobin is actually four subunits and collagen is three subunits. So collagen is three polypeptides and it's um, to build connective tissue throughout the body. It helps hold our body together. It's pretty important.
Hemoglobin is two alpha and two beta subunits, and each um, polypeptide also has what's called a heme component, which is an iron molecule, along with a few other things that help hold oxygen in place so that our blood can carry oxygen to the rest of our body. And then finally, ribosomes are actually just two polypeptides that are kind of put together, um, and they help build proteins. Um, ribosomes are really interesting because they also have an RNA unit as well, which um, makes the structure much more complex. So what determines protein structure? Well, structure can form on its own. Other proteins can aid in folding it. So we have proteins that help build other proteins. Protein structure also can depend on the environment. And proteins have what are called ideal conditions. If a protein isn't under its ideal conditions, it can undergo what's called denaturation. This is particularly important for high temperatures and high and low pHs. So proteins have a very specific area that they work really well in. And if you get above a certain temperature, it does what's called denaturation. And some proteins are able to go back to their original shape after denaturation, and some cannot. And this is why a high temperature fever can be so incredibly dangerous. If your temperature rises above about 104 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you generally want to go to the hospital because they're going to put you under an ice bath. At that temperature, some of your proteins, including proteins in your brain, can denature, and you can have major effects from that, and you can actually go into a coma because of it. So denaturation is incredibly important for paying attention to what happens to proteins. It's the same thing with um, acids and bases. So our stomach is full of proteins for helping digestion and breaking foods down and things like that. And if they couldn't handle that low, low pH, it's about a pH of 2, um, they would break apart. And so these proteins have evolved to handle those um, really low pHs. So this is the end of the protein video. Proteins are incredibly important. I would highly recommend there's a number of other videos on YouTube as well as the video, uh, the reading section for this part of the chapter. Proteins will show up on the AP test. They almost always do um, in terms of like building the structure and things like that. But they could also show up in um, what we call the central dogma of um biology, which is how proteins are made. So just be aware, we talk about protein structure now, we'll talk about it even more when we get into transcription and translation. So I hope this video is helpful, and um, this is the last of the biochem videos, so hooray for that. Um, sorry they're so long, hopefully they'll get shorter as the year goes on.